you, the audience, for being here today. Well, so maybe some of you are familiar with the story, but uh, I'm going to be very happily showing today um, the final data of our phase 2B trial in, um, in a serious mental disorder called borderline personality disorder. We are a publicly company, uh, traded company in Spain, so I need to call your attention to this legal notice. For those of you that are unfamiliar with the company, we are an epigenetic company. We develop uh, experimental drugs in oncology and in CNS around mainly, but not only, a target called LSD1, which is um, an histone dimethylase, a chromatin remodeler. And we have, um, in both areas, uh, we have advanced molecules. Um, the proposition that you um, that uh, we present to, 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 to the street, to the investors, is that we have a unique epigenetic approach in which all uh, or a significant part of our oncology program is basically leveraging on the collaboration that we have set up with the National Cancer Institute in the US and particularly our CRADA agreement with them, which allows us with a very marginal cost to explore the potential of our compound in significant um, uh, indication like, like a small cell lung cancer, for instance, or first line acute myeloid leukemia. But um, what I'm going to try to focus today is on our program in CNS, and particularly um, in borderline personality disorder, where uh, we are having a very strong interaction with the FDA, and we might become a phase three company in the next uh, few days. Okay, so um, we are um, uh, developing um, uh, LSD1 inhibitors in CNS. We are the, the, the only one doing that. I mean, the role of LSD1 in the CNS biology is well known, has been well described, and um, is uh, participating in a very important manner during development, but also is also pay, uh, playing a role in different pathologies. We know that LSD1 inhibition, we and others, uh, have demonstrated that LSD1 inhibition produces a significant reduction of aggressivity in different animal models, in various animal models. It produces an increase of sociability in various animal models, and it, pro, it, it produces an, uh, an increase in, in memory and, um, and, uh, and learning capabilities in various animal models. So we know all these things. These things we also know that um, at the genetic or molecular level, basically we are um, reprogramming uh, the genes which are in the prefrontal cortex, um, um, the early, immediate early genes and other uh, uh, which are involved on the stress control and in the connection with other parts of the brain, like the amygdala, hippocampus, and, and other regions. So we also know that um, LSD1 inhibition is able to restore the uh, glutamatergic uh, signal dysfunction in a number of animal models, particularly in schizophrenia, but also in, in other animal models. Okay, so we produced um, some time ago Bafidemstat. Bafidemstat is a small molecule is a highly selective uh, uh, LSD1 inhibitor. We have those so far, um, more than 400 people, uh, some of them up to two years, and it's a drug which is showing a very nice tolerability and safety profile. It's interestingly, um, it's also a highly brain penetrant molecule. We have CSF levels in humans, which are almost the same that in, in serum. And, um, and we see that it's safe and well tolerated. We don't have drug-drug interactions. And particularly, we have not seen any of the typical symptoms that you see on some of the antipsychotics, like, for instance, weight gain or um, uh, sedation, drowsiness, or loss of se uh, sexual appetite or extrapyramidal symptoms. So we did a phase two trial, uh, phase two A trial um, in borderline personality disorder, autism, and, uh, and uh, ADHD patients which were aggressive, and we saw a reduction of aggression, and we decided to move forward in this disease. Borderline personality disorder is a perfectly uh, described and, uh, um, uh, entity, clinical entity, is uh, very clearly um, uh, shown on the DSM-5, and it's a, a disorder which is highly prevalent. We are talking here between uh, uh, 0.8 to uh, more than 5%, uh, according to some uh, authors, on the general population. So we are talking about 9 million people in the US and Europe. These people have a very strong uh, different symptomatology, um, starting by a very strong dysfunctional interpersonal relationship. There are people that they don't have emotional filters. They attach very easily. They detach very dramatically. 
And um, normally this is um, uh, accompanied by an uh, impulsivity and aggressivity component, which are uh, is expressed in many ways. They are very vocal and, 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 uh, in verbal aggression. Um, and many, many times they are self-aggressive. They are autolytic. So they are, these are patients that they cut themselves, they burn themselves, they kill themselves. So uh, in this indication, there is nothing approved yet. Um, and there is a very, very uh, unpopulated pipeline. So Otsuka was trying to uh, develop a drug and they failed. Beringer in Ingelheim, they were trying to develop a drug and they failed. So we are the only one uh, that has, uh, as of today, are um, developing the drug, a drug, an advanced drug in this indication. So for that, we were um, uh, starting a phase 2B trial, a global trial. 60% of the patients were recruited in the US, the rest in several countries in Europe, with this um, scheme that you see here. We were proposing to the FDA at that moment that we were going to measure as an, uh, as an endpoint the average of the last three visits representing the last month of treatment. Because we think that this is a chronic disease and uh, you want to be sure that you get a sustained effect, a sustained um, uh, benefit over, over time. Okay, so um, what I'm showing you is what we were presenting yesterday in Milan at the European Conference of uh, Neuropsychopharmacology um, uh, in uh, College of Neuropsychopharmacology, yes. So the, um, the demographics of the trial, as you see, are very, uh, very balanced in both arms. So basically, um, young people, average age 32 years, majority of women. For some reasons, this uh, is a disease which is diagnosed more, more, more uh, in women than in men. Uh, majority white, white, slightly overweight uh, because they are also taking some antipsychotics and so on and so forth. The uh, baseline characteristics, um, uh, as you see here, for the different scales that we have used on this study are basically uh, similar in both arms, by basically reflecting that, yes, indeed, we are having here a population of um, severely affected BPD people that are basically allocated in an equal form to, to arms. Before I go to the next slides, I would like to make an, a, a small comment here because I think it's important. So normally in a, in, a, in a clinical trial, which is extremely important is what you measure and how you measure it. And uh, in indications like uh, schizophrenia, for instance, where we have been getting new uh, drugs approved on the, on the last years, very recently the, the Karuna's case, for instance, we know, I mean, the regulators, the industry, the doctors, we know exactly how we need to measure a patient to see a pharmacological improvement. However, in an indication like borderline personality disorder, the situation is clearly different because nobody knows really what's the best way to measure. So for this reason, we agree with the FDA that we were going to basically measure aggression and overall improvement of the disease, these, these two um, uh, aspects or dimensions of the disease, but we were going to do so by duplicating in each case with two scales. Of course, you have to choose uh, one as primary, you have to pick one as, uh, as, as primary, another as secondary, because otherwise you would go to a clinical trial which would require 1,000 patients and which is not affordable for a small company. So we, we, we pick as primary endpoints uh, CGI in aggression, which is a well-known um, uh, scale, and borderline personality disorder as overall um, severity of the disease. And here, what you can see is that um, we see a small improvement on the patients treated um, uh, with our compounds uh, as measured by uh, CGI in terms of aggressivity, but clearly this improvement is insufficient to get uh, clinical significance. Same story with the secondary primary endpoint, the second primary endpoint, excuse me, were uh, measuring the uh, overall uh, the severity of the disease by BPDCL. We saw an improvement of the patients treated with our drug, but again, this improvement is insufficient. So in any other indication, in schizophrenia, as for the sake of the example that we were mentioning, that would be it. It would be one other uh, uh, failed study. I mean, you, you have a rational, you do your best, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But again, here, we, we, as we said, we had discussed with the FDA that we wanted to measure more things. And what you see here is the variation of aggression 
basically measured by the Stuxy treat angle scale. And here the separation is very neat. So we get on, a, on an average on the last month, P007, and a global average compared to the placebo uh, treated um, group of almost 60%. Why we are, are we mentioning these percentages? Because we, when we were starting this trial, we said to the doctors, we asked to the doctors, well, beyond the, or besides the statistical significance, what would be for you a, a clinically relevant improvement on those patients? So they told us 25% would be really monumental for these patients, which are already severely affected. So we, we get here P007 with 60% on the average of the last month, with some points, as you can see, of 92% um, at some time points. As you know, there is variability in these trials and in these uh, scales. And interestingly, in the, overall stat in the overall severity, we see something similar here when we measure the patients by, a second, uh, by, by a, another scale, the, the, the best scale. Here again, we see a clear and neat uh, differentiation with a probability of P002 and almost 31% of overall improvement. It's interesting because as a, another secondary endpoint, we were exploring depression. These patients are very often having comorbidity or concomitant depression because they feel bad and they know that they are bad. So here we don't get, um, uh, we don't get uh, um, uh, statistical significance, but still we get an interesting trend of P009 with 42% of improvement over the placebo treated group. Okay, so interestingly, when we did the T4 plot, what we saw is that all the measurements on primary and secondary endpoints were consistently favoring the Bafidenstat the, the Bafidenstat uh, treated group over the placebo, which in colloquial terms is like if you are tossing a coin 15 times and you are 15 times getting hurts. So, it is not impossible, of course, but is highly unlikely. For this reason, um, the firm that was running the statistical analysis plan for us was also doing the global statistical test, which is a specific statistical test to measure if you have basically a, poly, um, a polysymptomatic or holistic improvement. So when they keep adding the different, uh, the different scales to this, uh, to this uh, analysis, as you can see, starting by the primaries, you get 0.021, then you, 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 you start adding the other scales of the aggression and the depression, and you get at the end a P003, so globally significant. So uh, that was really um, uh, suggestive. We went to the, uh, anal we, we analyzed also the safety. We also saw that these patients were basically having much less uh, uh, inclination towards uh, self-harm in the, the, the patients treated with our drug than the ones with placebo. Only one patient over, uh, compared to six, six patients with 10 episodes. So as I said, we, we, we went to the FDA to discuss a possible uh, phase three uh, and how we could move forward. And we have been discussing uh, over the summer with them. It has been a very intense summer. So we are now in the period of 30 days. So probably in the next uh, few days, um, or next week, we will know if the FDA agrees with us or not, if we can move with this data in a, a pre-agreed phase three uh, clinical trial, which would be the first one in this space in many, many years. So we think that we have an enormous commercial opportunity here. And the reason for that is that we believe that uh, there is a, a, a huge market, a huge population of, uh, of patients, but also we are addressing what is matters for the patient. So we did a, quali a qualitative research, a super study within the phase 2B study, and we were asking the patients a number of questions about what was uh, the life of a BPD patient. What were they feeling on the daily life? What was the most bothersome uh, symptom? What they would like to have to become more normal between brackets? And this is one, uh, one of the many examples that we get on this on this um, uh, qualitative research study. And as you can see, the frequency of responses of the patients uh, as the most bothersome uh, symptoms on their daily life is uh, uh, impulsivity, anger, the incapability to cope with frustration, uh, the irritability. So we think that with the data that I have been sharing with you um, uh, in the previous slide, we are basically addressing to the nuclear aspects 
that the patients are referring to as part of their condition. Then we were asking the doctors three or four years ago, ago what would they be asking in a drug uh, for them to prescribe uh, uh, in borderline personality disorder. And they told us, well, you have to control impulsivity, but don't put them up to sleep. I mean, uh, they have to have a normal life, a functionality. They have to keep their jobs, their relations. So that's what they were telling us three years ago. And when we published the results of this trial, what they were basically telling us is that the drug indeed was satisfying what they wanted. So we think that we have uh, the adherence of the patients, we have the adherence of the prescribers. We will see what the FDA thinks about the uh, phase three moving forward. And um, with all this, we think that um, uh, this drug might sell more than three and a half billion only in BPD. And of course, uh, to be at in other indications. Let me mention that um, besides or beyond our composition of matter uh, uh, protection, we have a significant additional protection that has been granted recently by, by significant uh, commercial territories like uh, the European Patent Office, Japan, and so on and so forth, where we have the patents to treat BPD with Bapidenstat that extend significantly the, um, the extension uh, and the exclusivity period of this, com of this compound. We have another program ongoing in schizophrenia. There is a genetic lien, uh, there is preclinical data I was mentioning, and there is no one so far uh, addressing negative symptoms, which is what we are trying on this phase 2B trial. So um, this is something that is still is ongoing, so no data in the, in the near future. But of course, uh, schizophrenia, as you all know, has been a, a real hotspot in the last uh, one year for the big pharma. And we think that is adding a very uh, interesting additional um, attractiveness to our program. So let me just finalize with a couple of mentions to financing. So with our science, we have been very uh, lucky and happy and honored to be uh, funded by the European Union, by the Spanish government, regional governments, and so on and so forth. And in many cases, these uh, fundings were half a million, one million, one million and a half. But what I am um, showing you, this is one in a life, once in a lifetime. So we have been selected to be part of a pan-European project, which is going to mobilize more than one billion in state aid uh, um, uh, resources, um, where uh, it's involving six countries, 40 companies, and we are one of the Spanish members of this uh, team. We have a, a, a basically a, a budget which is ranging between 20 to 25 million. We expect an intensity of subvention of 60 to 70 percent, which means that we are going to get basically uh, as a new fresh treasury between 14 to 17 and a half million by the beginning of next year. So what we are going to do with this? I mean, um, we are about to know in one week, if we are going to become a phase three company in a huge opportunity, we have uh, this coming, this money coming from the European Union plus other money that can represent 20 million. And uh, of course, uh, we are a public company. We are publishing our uh, quarterly, our accounts. So you can see that we were ending uh, um, 23 with 12 million, that we were ending June with 10 million, which represents, um, I mean, reflects the fact that we have stopped already the clinical trial and that we are very cash um, uh, prudent in this moment. Um, we have all the preps to, to go to an NDA, uh, to NASDAQ uh, almost already or almost ready. So we are basically going to see how the market uh, takes the news from the FDA. And uh, depending on, on how we, we see um, this, we can be very reactive. Um, Precisely considering that, uh, as I say, once in a lifetime, we are going to get 20 million of non-dilutive money. So that's it. Um, thank you for listening to, to me today. I think I, uh, we are the last one. If you have any question, I will be very happy to take it.